So do you remember back in high school when you had to do the whole classification thing? You know, the King Philip came over for green spinach. You know, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Well, here we are back in vertebrate zoology doing the same thing again, only just applying it to vertebrates at this point in time. But things have gotten a little bit messy since high school. In fact, things have gotten really messy because we have a whole bunch of new techniques that Linnaeus didn't have when he developed this classification system. So today we're going to start to look at this whole idea of how do we classify vertebrates. But it really comes down to what is a species? Take a moment. Write down your definition of what do you think constitutes a species? How would you define one species as different from another species. So write it down and then we're going to take a look at that and see how your definition compares to what scientists are saying today. So this whole idea of a species falls into this categorization that we've been using for years. I mean, you're really comfortable with it. I mean, you know kingdoms. In fact, we're in the kingdom Animalia this semester. You know phylums. We're in the phylum chordata. You know classes, and we're going to be looking at a whole bunch of different classes. You know class amphibia, class reptilia, class aves, class chondroichthys. I mean, you even know orders like anurans with frogs. You've got families down. You know some of the genuses. In fact, you're going to be learning a lot of genuses this semester, but it really comes down to the species. And the, you had the little acronym all down, you know, King Philip came over for green spinach. But what is a species? This last little bit in this order of biosystematics that Linnea has put together, what is a species? You know, this whole idea of a species concept is really nothing new. I mean, Solomon said it best, there's nothing new under the sun. In fact, the whole idea of classifying starts right with Adam. Back in Genesis 2, 18 through 20, Adam is talked to by God, and what's his first job? To name the living organisms, i.e. the first classification system. You know, a little bit later, along comes Solomon. And in 1 Kings 4, 33, it says that he described plant life, from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the walls. He also taught about animals and birds and reptiles and fish. I mean, let's get right down to it. Solomon was a biosystematic, biosystematic professor. You know, things got a little complicated. We we're getting a little messy. And along came Linnaeus. Linnaeus took us to this whole biosystematics that we use today. For the most part, like I said, it got a little bit messy because when Darwin came along and introduced this whole idea of common descent, people started to look at how we classify things a lot differently. And then in the 1940s, Ernst Mayer came up with the biological species concept. In fact, his biological species concept says that species are groups of actually or potentially interbreeding natural populations which are reproductively isolated from other groups. So how in the world do we know if they're interbreeding populations? How do we know if they're reproductively isolated from other such groups? And a lot of that comes down to, in, linea in Mayer's day, it came down to looking at physiology, looking at morphology, doing character studies. You know, you really had to look at species to determine if they were potentially interbreeding or if they were reproductively isolated. And a lot of that had to deal with morphology. In fact, it was defined a little bit later in the early 1970s by Sneath and Sokol that this whole idea of a phonetic species concept, where a species is a set of organisms that are phenotypically similar and that look different from other sets of organisms. So we're going to look at things that, well, look alike. And 
we're going to say, do these two things that look alike interbreed? So kind of building on Mayer's species concept and adding to it. But again, we're still looking at morphology here. Another set of principles for species came about a little bit later, the whole idea of a recognition species concept that species are actually sets of organisms that can recognize each other as potential mates. Now this widens the pool quite a bit because this now starts to allow for hybridization to take place. For instance, the barred owl, which is an eastern owl species here in Michigan. Uh, if you come into my office, you're going to see a picture of a barred owl hanging on my wall. But in my office, you're also going to see a picture of a spotted owl, which is a western, northwestern old growth species. Here's two species. If you look at the pictures, they look very similar to each other, but they've been geographically separate from each other. Barred owl species start to expand their range. Guess what? Barred owls come into the range of spotted owls. Barred owls and spotted owls start to interbreed with each other. So really, this definition of a recognition species concept that Caldwell is getting at, it's really what we're seeing with barred owls and spotted owls. And, in fact, they've even given a name to these new species called sparred owls. So there's a lot of questions. Is the spotted owl a unique, genetically different species? Well, at one point we probably would have said yes, but now we're a little bit less sure of that. So we start to add more pieces to it. And probably the most recent and most used species concept that's being used right now is what we call the phylogenetic species concept. And this is where we're actually going to be going in our next class. And it says that a species is a tip on the phylogeny, that is the smallest set of organisms that share an ancestor and can be distinguished from other such sets. Well, how do we distinguish from other such sets? Well, now we're getting down to DNA. So now, Instead of just using morphology, we're using morphology and phylogeny and DNA fingerprinting and recognition. We're using the whole gamut of tools in the toolbox to try to determine is this species specifically unique from other species. And this brings us to a whole new idea that we're going to be looking at in our next class that's called cladistics. Now, there is one more species concept out there. It's not widely accepted. Why is it widely accepted? Because it goes back to the whole idea of species as distinguished by Adam. And we call it the baromological species concept. And this concept, fairly new, takes a different approach to things. It says that a species is a lineage of hollow baromen. And we're going to look at what a hollow baromen is in the next class. That's stable in morphology and interfertile in practice. I'll take that apart. Stable in morphology. They're going to look like each other. Interfertile in practice. They interbreed with each other. So we're looking for lineages that have similar morphology, but also the, the ability to interbreed with each other. Kind of a different take on Mayer's species, biological species concept. So get this down, read your chapter, come prepared. We're going to do some cladistics. We're going to try to build some phylogenetic trees in our next class. And we're going to see what we can do with trying to understand the species concept.